me, Nor Williams, getting my geek on with some sweet movie science. Ooh, I'm dizzy. Coming up on Science of the Movies, how do you harness cutting edge software? When I lift him up, oh, he's waving. Mad geniuses. You need them all, you know, sniff around, you know, let it take you. And solar power. It's a very magical process. To make the mutant mole from City of Ember. What makes IMAX a mega movie-going experience? This movie is about two and three-quarter hours. It's 48 reels or one hard drive. I'll take the hard drive. There's more to it than meets the eye. Man, this is styrofoam. As I undergo a cinematic gun tech boot camp. That was almost 30 rounds. Prepare to be blown away. Hit me. Digital creatures. You see them all over film and television, menacing innocent humans. But of course, these nasties don't really exist. But how are they made? Where do they come from? Well, I'm visiting the virtual effects virtuosos here at Luna Pictures, and we're gonna find out. Payam? Hey, Nar. How are you? Nice, nice to meet you. you. This is Payam. He's one of the founders of Luma Pictures, and he's got over 60 films under his belt as a visual effects maestro. Tell me uh, uh, about Luma Pictures. What is Luma Pictures? We've, since the beginning, tried to focus on um, doing all the most complex visual effects type work, which is primarily creature stuff and animals. Creatures, hmm, like something cute and furry, like an Ewok? Recently, we worked on a really cool film called City of Ember for Walden. There's this CG star nose mold. And in real life, it's this like six inch creature. Ah, he's adorable in a creepy nightmare sort of way. And the director just envisioned it grew um, to nine feet in size and um, was sort of terrorizing the people. A giant killer mole with a tentacle nose? Who would create such a monstrosity? A cabal of evil geniuses, that's who. So Nara, this is the team of lead artists and supervisors and producers that worked on City of Ember. Man, I'm outnumbered. You know what's awesome about this setup? I feel like I'm at a Jedi Council. <laughs> right? We're all in the room, like, in the Obi -Wan over here, the hologram. <laughs> the force is strong with these guys. They've had a hand in over 50 features in the last seven years. For City of Ember, the Luma gang worked with director Gil Keenan to create the rampaging mole creature. Keenan knew he wanted a star-nosed mole, but much bigger and meaner. So how did they make him into such a believable bruiser? The physics and the musculature of a six-inch creature are very different than something that needs to be the size of a nine-foot walrus. So we do animation tests, and we're like, well, you know, if it's, if it's this large and it's moving like that little creature, the audience won't believe its weight. These guys started off with nature footage and artwork from the film's design team. For help in how to create a gargantuan creature, just look up your neighborhood biology professor. If you scale an animal to a larger size, it's difficult to anticipate what aspects of the physiology might fail, because some aspects are going to vary with the area, and some are going to depend on the volume. So to use a human example, humans need their skeleton so to support their weight. And the weight of a human depends on its volume. The strength of a human's bones depend on their cross-sectional area. So as humans get very large, we have trouble supporting our own weight. The Luma folks agree, to build a bigger mole, they had to re-engineer him from the inside out. And they're going to give me a crash course in how they did it. The first step in making a mole monster is called modeling. Loic is going to show me how to shape the critter out of digital clay. So you're actually creating the shape of it, really? Yeah, yeah, it's like sculpture, actually. So you, you just define the body and the limbs and the face and then where things are going to be, you know, very roughly first. Um, it's kind of geometrical and, and simple. And, uh, and then you redefine it. So to model this mold, to sculpt this mold into the shape that you want it to be, do you study the anatomy of, of certain animals and then, and then kind of apply that? Or? I like to compare that to Frankenstein because you take pieces of a lot of creatures and you end up with one new one in the end. So what creatures did you study the anatomy of to create this Frankenstein? The mole is really like used for the face, for the nose, for the, for the claws, uh, for the global proportions of the body, I would say. 
everything that is related to flesh, fat, is more of the other guy. And I forgot the name because I'm not English. This big guy from the sea, you know? Oh, the walrus. Uh, because of the scale, yeah. you have more flesh to carry. And because you have more flesh to carry, you have more weight, you have more details. Loic uses a tool called a Z brush that simulates the process of working with clay. This is really like this software program and having the tab and the pen. It's like replacing having a big hunk of clay and a bunch of sharp tools to, to kind of sculpt well, it with. Yeah, it's really completely inspired. If I want a tough mold, <laughs> I'm going to make a tough mold. So let's create some muscle here, you know. Let's create a shoulder like that. Can I, could I try Go ahead, be my guess. Oh, now I'm just adding. And you see you a big, big muscle here. I'm making yeah, him a clay. Now, what if I wanted to kind of take away from? How so, did you rotate him? Oh, uh, you just have to press into the gray area and, oh, and rotate. Whoa. That's fairly Ooh, simple. I'm dizzy. Cool sculpture, but how did they train it to attack? In order to make a move, they needed the inside, the muscles, and the bones, and Vince. Rigging is the foundation of uh, how we make surfaces move, and they're, they're integral to the animation process. Uh, it's the first step of where, where we take a model, and we put bones inside of it. So for example, here on the screen, we have some reference of a skeleton. Oh, so, so you, you look at the real mole skeleton uh, for reference, and then you create your own mole skeleton because it's not going to be the exact same thing. Yeah, it's exactly right. And but this doesn't look like you know bones. It doesn't look like a skeleton. What what am I seeing here? Well, you're looking at uh, a system of controls for the animators. The black cones and balls are the limbs. Dance, mole, dance. Okay, so you create the skeleton, which allows you to move the frame of the mole in a way. Then what's next? Well, we fill it in with muscle and you'll see that those same skeletal oh, systems wow. are driving the muscles. This mole was ripped, but these muscles aren't just for show. They all work like the real thing. Okay, so what, what am I gonna grab here? This box here? Yeah. All right, woo! Oh, wow, and I can really see... Oh, and I, when I lift him up, oh, he's waving. So Tana has some examples of how all this comes together. Uh, in the first example, you could see that he's testing out the threshold of how the muscles react with the skin. And you see the muscles are deforming the skin properly. And you'll also notice now that he has run a simulation that adds jiggle and fat. I see and that. And you see how there's, uh, yeah, there, the butt is jiggling. A little bit of junk in the trunk. There right? is a bit of junk in the trunk. Nice trunk. Rigging allows the imaginary creature to move based on real-world physical properties, like gravity and tension. Once the digital digger looks believable, it gets shipped off to the animation department. Meet Raphael, the Mole Whisperer. Action and, and acting, right? Action is something that's based on movement, and but acting is something that comes from inside, right? So if you're able to get a character to think before he moves, you're able to sell it, you're able to get everyone to believe this creature is really there. So what did you do to, to, to figure that out? You have to like completely throw like shyness out to the garbage. Yeah. You know, you have to stand up and you have to be a mole. All right, so. For an animation to be successful, you have to get out of your chair sometimes and act like a mole. And this is where you would do it, like right here in the office. This was actually the perfect place for it because it had all these sort of obstacles and aisles, and we use this as sort of the Pipeworks world of, of Ember, which was the underground. So, right. yeah, we use this as, as our domain. We gotta get your, your hands out. Okay, so these are tentacles. Yeah, these are the tentacles, Okay, yeah. all right. So you put it in front of your, your mouth and be a mole, you know, sniff around, you know, let it take you wherever you wanna go. This is where the digital creature, the ones and zeros, quickly comes to life. All right, here we go. This time with feeling. All right. All right. <laughs> Up next, we dig so far into Mole Making 101. Ooh, that looks pretty creepy cool. We go off the deep end. You and later, IMAX has what I want. The Dark Knight. Can I take one of these home? You have plenty of them. I came to 
Luma Pictures to find out how their visual effects work for the movie City of Ember unleashed a giant killer star-nosed mole onto the world. In real life, it's this like six inch creature and the director just envisioned it grew to nine feet. Inspired by nature and production artwork, Team Mole designed the creature, then engineered it from the inside out, creating a virtual skeletal and muscular system, then used computer animation and method acting to bring the zeros and ones to life. Now, even though this mole never sees the sun, you still have to light it. So Oliver, uh, tell me why we're up here on the roof. What are we getting ready to do here? Well, we're gonna um, talk about lighting and CG. This is Oliver. He has to light things that don't really exist. No wonder he's gone crazy and appears to be relying on magic. We're gonna take some reference uh, of this uh, mirror sphere ball to capture the real world lighting and then transfer it in a computer more easily. So I'm gonna have you hold this up for me. This looks like a palantir. Yes. I feel like I should have a wizard costume on. You shall not pass! It's a very magical process. Well, this uh, magical ball will help us to capture the real world lighting and then reproduce it in the computer more easily. You're gonna take pictures of me with this ball and then put the, the photographs and everything into your computer and it kind of reads the lighting, whether it's bright or, or where the shade is coming from and all mm -hmm. that. And you can even adjust it afterwards. Sweet, all right, cool. So um, you just need me to strike a few poses here? Or? Yeah, well, I need to stand right there and hold it up real nice, okay? A few photographs of the mirror ball will give Oliver the information he needs to light a shot of me and the superstar mole. So I started um, by cleaning up the so-called plate, which is you on the roof. This is the original photo that you took? Yes. Okay. And we're gonna put the mole in there. Oliver uses a close-up on the mirror ball I was holding to create a lighting plan called a lat-long map. So you're, you're unwrapping this 3D sphere and you're unwrapping it almost like a globe on a, on a world map yes, into an image like that? Exactly like, you know, at, at school, at work, yeah, one of those world maps. After the small sphere is unwrapped, he can digitally reproject it onto a larger sphere like a big bubble that contains the roof, me, and Mr. Mole. So now the, the mole is, is surrounded by the picture almost. Yes. And then you can place the mole at any point within that environment, right? That's correct, yes. And we can even, you know, rotate around the, around the mole since we have, you know, the sphere covers almost the entire environment, so the lighting is covered from almost every angle. The mole seems to be automatically lit as if it was up there on the roof with me. We can put the mega mole anywhere, shoot it from any angle, and the lighting will be perfect. So he is right next to you, sitting right there, staring at you and pulling <laughs> up the ball. Looking hungry. We really nailed the real world lighting. I mean, if I look at the, the brightness here and the way the light is falling on my leg, it's the exact same as along the back of the mole. Oliver, you are truly a lord of light. Thank you. Sure. Cheers. The creature is really coming together now, but holy Yoda, the mole is nude. Okay, Jared, so now we're really getting down into the details of the creature, the hair. Meet Jared and his amazing hairball. So this is what we start with right out of the box. So the, the software hair. kind of starts you with this? Yep, all the hair is just pointing up. The styling process starts with generic hair on a basic sphere. From there, Jared adds the parameters, making it malicious. And then you, what? You apply length, uh, coarseness, thickness. So there's different things like stiffness, which can make it so that it just sticks oh, up yeah, in all directions. Oh, yeah, looks like a hairspray there. Yeah. OK. Normally, you start out with like a small amount just for speed. You just want to get the basic uh, length and the, how it flows down first. So to, the, to that, we have this brush tool. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you can control different things, like the direction it's going. So you can say which direction, and then you see it. So you can flow. just brush, brush the hair right there. And do yep. Are you replacing, but with this brush tool, you're placing the hair the, where the hair is going to be on the creature? Yeah, we're brushing uh, guide hairs. So there's a few hairs that we're actually brushing here. And then between all those hairs, the computer will interpolate millions, hundreds of thousands, however many hairs we decide. Oh, to go with the guide hairs. Yep, exactly. Oh, OK, I see. Which keeps it able to run on the computer and not crash. 
Because if you have millions of hairs on the computer moving, uh, the, the processing is, yeah. speed isn't going to be able to keep up with it. Exactly. Once you've got the right hair, you take it out into the real world. What are you applying here? Just so this, gravity? This is just gravity. Yeah. Okay. Well, that looks pretty creepy cool. Drag. That'll make it so that when they move this around, it kind of floats. It, yeah. uh, it doesn't keep on going in the same direction. It loses its momentum very quickly. Jared transforms the mole's pelt from stuffed animal cute to real world nasty. Uh, you know what really sells it for me, the detail, is the way the hair goes in different directions. Some of it's more matted down, some of it's sticking up. You know, it really looks like it's messed up and that it's, it's been in a cramped space. From modeling to rigging to animation to lighting and hair, the Luma crew has built a super mole, bigger, stronger, and hairier. When it comes to making him a star and putting him into the movie, Justin is the master manipulator. So you're the uh, you're the you're the last stop here for our digital creatures. Yeah, that's me. What do you do? Um, it's called compositing. The 3D geometry is brought into a program to layer it all together and adjust it for final output for the film. So basically, compositing is taking several layers and putting them all together into one image to put on screen? Yeah. How long does it take, like, from beginning to end to composite all this stuff together? Or something? Uh, it really depends on how complex the shot is. This looks pretty complex. Yeah, this probably took a few weeks. For the mole shot, Justin had to deal with up to 150 layers of information. So here in, in the plate, we have the actor against a green screen. Why is it that we use a green screen for where the creature comes up? Well, there's a very specific color that we can use to say that's what we want to replace. Nothing in the scene has that exact color, so we can say with this green, replace it and remove it uh, and put something else there. Once the background and the flying debris are in, it's time to add the mole. Many, many versions of the mole. So. One of the first things that that's uh, included in our passes is the color pass. It's just simply the color values of the skin and his mouth and his teeth. Just color information. Just color information. The next thing, I guess, would be what makes this look, look like skin. Uh, this is called subsurface. It's like that look that you get when you put a flashlight behind your fingers and you can see the light coming through your fingers. Now this you're adding fur on. Why do you go through all the trouble of the skin and the light and the colors of the skin and everything if you're just going to put a bunch of fur on top of it? Sometimes you see through the fur. Mm. You know, in this case, the fur isn't completely opaque, so you, know, you have to have something there. There are different lighting and texture passes, and Justin can fine-tune as he goes. What if I decided that uh, I wanted to see his mouth tentacles look a little wetter? All right, so what I would do there is just brighten it up so that it looks a little bit more like a glossy reflection. Wet your lips, Mole. It's time for your close-up. Honestly, though, Justin, like, I feel like I've seen this mole today from birth. <clears throat> I don't know if I can let it go. That's sad. Thanks for the great work, and thanks for showing us. Sure. Big bump. Boom goes the dynamite. Later, brother. From concept to modeling to lighting to animating, visual effects pros at Luna Pictures combine the real world with the virtual world by using their technical skills and artistic vision. Stay tuned to see how IMAX delivers the goods. Dude, you ship IMAX movies and pizza boxes? They're really deep dish. And we give major props to the guys who arm the actors. Dude, what's this, a rocket launcher? This is. It's a 3.5 rocket launcher. Whoa! These days, it's all about viewing on the go, right? Whether you're stuck in traffic, watching a movie that's playing in the SUV in front of you, or catching a flick on your phone, it seems like if you can't put it in your pocket or under your airplane seat, then it's not worth it. But come on, is a four-inch monitor really the best way to take in the cinematic sweetness of a film like The Dark Knight? If you really want to feel like you're in a movie, there's only one place to go. IMAX.
IMAX was derived from the words maximum image, and you might be tempted to call it maxi, but that doesn't begin to capture the immersive experience of watching eye-popping 3D docs or major Hollywood flicks in a theater like this. So now I'm here with Greg Foster. He's the president of IMAX Filmed Entertainment. This is the man who decides what gets shot and what gets shown in IMAX. IMAX is about scope. IMAX is about transporting you into this immersive world. Filmmakers are secret weapon. We are literally dealing with the biggest and most visionary filmmakers out there, and they want to constantly push things. For an audience, IMAX technology is in your face, literally. There's a relationship, the geometry, between where people sit and the screen that, that brings people inside the movie. A typical IMAX screen is 52 by 72 feet, way larger than normal movie screens. It's also placed closer to the audience and is slightly curved. That means the images on screen completely fill your field of vision. Add in stadium seating so you don't have to worry about big dude right in front of me syndrome and up to 18,000 watts of digital surround sound and you are ready for a primo movie going experience. When filmmakers make a movie, they're not usually making the movie for a small 40 inch television screen. They're making the movie for, if they can, their imagination for a 70 foot wide screen. But how do you fill that screen with a crystal clear image? especially if it wasn't shot with a specialized IMAX camera. I'm heading to the IMAX vault to find the guy with all the answers. David Keeling. Uh, Nar. What's up, man? David is the head of post-production, and he is impervious to cold. Why is it so cold in here? Well, it's to keep the film good for a long period of time. This vault is a constant 55 degrees, preserving 80% of all IMAX movies ever made, including Dude, the dark, Dude, hey, the, the dark night. Can I can I take one of these home? You have plenty of them. No, Warner Brothers would not be happy. I'll keep my house at 55 <laughs> degrees. Uh, not a chance. Even if you didn't mind hyperthermia, it would still be tricky keeping an IMAX negative in your house. IMAX is a motion picture system that was developed in, in the, the late 60s where we get the largest negative in the world. The IMAX film negative is nine times the size of regular 35 millimeter film. Nine times. What's nine times the size of me? A humpback whale. IMAX film is called 7015 because it's 70 millimeter film with 15 perforations instead of four. And it's horizontally, not vertically oriented. That huge negative means the image stays sharp when it's blown up big on the screen. That's how we did it before. We still do it that way, but now we also have a digital versions of our film and film version. IMAX films can be shot using massive 3D IMAX film cameras that weigh about 200 pounds, or they can take a conventional negative and digitally transform it in high-tech clean rooms. So David, I take it this is the first step in converting a conventional film into an IMAX film, right? What we're doing here, we have a 35 millimeter scanner and a 65 millimeter scanner. And what we're doing is taking the analog film and putting it in the digital do domain, making it into ones and zeros. And this is where we scan Dark Knight, where we're scanning for Transformers 2. But basically, there's a lens here, uh, and there's a light source, and it's scanning, you know, pixel for pixel as that moves along. This process involves scanning the whole movie one single frame at a time. And this is this, this tells you exactly what frame just got right. scanned. That's this right. shows you it. And, and this tells you how much time you have left. Right. Wow, how cool. And if you're hearing this click, that's 12.8 seconds apart. It's an 8K scan. When the you say 8K scan, that's 8,000 pixels per frame? Yes, correct. 8,000 pixels across. Imagine what would happen if you put your nose up to a movie on your phone, a big mess of pixels. This 8K scan means you can blow up images to the size of a barn and still keep all that fine detail. So it takes a good long time. And so film... for one movie, how long? Well, I mean, you know, you could be scanning here literally for, for months sometimes. So where does it go? To a server? We have 100 terabytes of storage. That's where it's going now, through fiber optics into our storage area network to get ready for us to do the next process, which will be dust busting. Yep, he just said dust busting. But it's not like cleaning the chip crumbs out of your couch. So if there is dirt in the scan, then you have to what's called dust bust and get that dirt out by a process by just looking at every frame and say, oh, there's a piece of dirt, and then you have a pro computer program to replace those pixels, and then it goes to the next process, the DMR, the digital remastering process up in, in Toronto. The DMR process applies a top secret algorithm to the scans that sharpen the grain of ordinary film, a step you don't need when shooting with an IMAX camera, like this was. 
Then it gets sent back here for final quality control and transformation into a film print or a digital projection format. And we're basically just doing overall uh, uh, corrections here, take into account our extra brightness, our extra contrast for the IMAX projector. This step also allows IMAX to make special adjustments, like compensating for the extra darkness caused by stylish 3D glasses. Put your 3D glasses on. Now, since you're, this isn't in 3D, let's put two 3D glasses on, because okay. you got to pretend you're a projector and a viewer. Oh, I and did? That, okay. That's right. And then we look at, look at this and we decide, you know, because it gets a little bit darker. So for 3D, you have to adjust and compensate for your glasses and we do that in here and uh <laughs> do the guys adjusting actually put on two glasses like this what will i do it's a very <laughs> sophisticated do. process now <laughs> this is the scientific process that's correct now you've gone through the dmr process you've finalized the color uh corrections um and now what well now you go into uh, um, a process where you, you package it, you make the DCP. The DCP is the digital cinema package, basically the whole movie on this little guy. The hard drive goes in just a little case like this. You can also get your IMAX movie delivered on film, but you better wear a weight belt. Whoa, so wait, wait, hold on, let me get this straight. Okay. We got a movie on this hard drive. That's right. And the same movies on all, how many reels is this? This movie is about two and three quarter hours. It's 48 reels or one hard drive. Okay, I'll take the hard drive. Fine for me. But a lot of IMAX theaters still use film projectors. Every new theater built though, will have a digital system. How do you ship all this? Over here behind us, we've got uh, the, the 70 millimeter prints will go in two of these stacks. Dude. You ship IMAX movies in pizza boxes? Yeah, we do. Uh -uh. They're, they're very, they're, they're really deep dish. Once these boxes reach the theater, the film has to be pieced together, then loaded onto a platter. How, how many people does it take to load this on a reel? About six. Six people? Yeah. But we have lifts in the theaters, you know, like little... There's uh, fork like... lifts that are equipped in the IMAX theater? That's correct. To move these platters. You're not even kidding, are you? No, I'm not kidding. So all this just gets threaded up in the projector right over here, right? That's correct. David took me to the IMAX headquarters projection booth to check out both film and digital projection systems. So it's coming from the platter, the film, and then it looks like it gets threaded in the projector. Right. Why are there two? Uh... Well, this is that's the feed, that's input and, okay. and output. And if it was 3D, there'd be two strands going in and two strands going out. One for the left eye, one for the right eye. Okay. Just, just like in the digital projectors right here. So these are the digital projectors? These, these are the digital projectors. Can I plug the hard drive yeah, in now? Yeah, you can. We'll just show you how you do that. And awesome. Just, here's a USB cable. Yes. We'll put it there. And that's all there is to it. Well, it may... That's it? Well, that's it. But you know what? It's not instant. This is a two and three quarter hour movie. And we'll just plug it in there. And it takes about two and three quarter hours to actually ingest it in the projector. The picture quality is the same with both projectors. The main difference is the real estate. These projectors look roughly half the size of the film projector. Right. Why, why is that? Is it just because the film has to live in there? Or is the lamp bigger? Or well, I mean, the it's a, bigger? You know, I, these, are, these are, you know, 40-year-old designs. So therefore, you know, it's a mechanical projector. So mechanical things are bigger than digital things. This is we just know that. all microchips and... That's correct. Hey, David, now yeah. that I've seen what goes into IMAX movies that make them so awesome, I really want to go watch one. Okay, well, why don't you go down to the theater and I'll power up the system and you'll see IMAX for real. Yes, thanks, man. Thanks, man. Thanks to the specialized technologies developed at IMAX, we can all feel like we are in the movies. Hit me! Gun, gap, peace, persuader. No matter what you call them, handling real firearms correctly is a matter of life and death. So when actors, or hardcore TV hosts, are packing heat, how do they stay safe? We're on a mission to independent studio services to scout out the science behind faking firepower and everything else. Yes, there is a science to assembling and creating this mountain of guns, goods, and gear. 
The man behind these props is Greg Bilson, a prop master whose father started the business in his garage. So are you like more like a, a distribution service to independent props masters? Like, like props masters for a certain movie come to you and say, hey, I really need uh, that phonograph. Everybody deals with this differently. Sometimes we'll get a phone call from somebody in Michigan that needs one thing. Sometimes they film will be in Los Angeles and they need to come here and load up their trucks with all things. ISS stocks over one million props with branches all over the United States. Chances are you've seen their goods on screen, especially if it's a period film. This is our period room and we have props here from the turn of the century, the, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. This looks so new. Well, sometimes you're doing a 1940s film and it's 1940s, so it has to look new. Other times you're doing a film from 2009 and it has to look like an old piece. We go to garage sales, I buy from eBay. We have a, an effects department that ages things down and an effects department that, that makes things look new again. ISS makes their own imitation legal tender, but making fake currency is an inexact science. That's right, I said inexact on purpose. We have to be very careful because Secret Service monitors that. If we get too close to real, we've ultimately created counterfeit money, and we have actually been uh, visited by Secret Service and told not to do that again. Wow. Yeah, a little scary. Do you have like a like a, a counterfeit printing press on site here? Or like We don't like to call it counterfeit. We like to call it props, because counterfeit would tend to indicate you're doing something illegal for bad reasons. If props are done wrong, that's the only time you notice because then it stands out. If they're done really well, it all just fits. Like uh, Tony Montana, cocaine to go. Hey, that's just styrofoam. Yeah. But if you're doing a cocaine film and a drug film, it's right. Yeah, it, it passes for it, that's for go. sure. It's not all about crime here at ISS. One of their specialties is heavy-duty peacekeeping hardware. Meet Drew Petrata, a third-generation prop master and my military escort for the day. Whoa, there is a whole section of this warehouse quartered off for just military gear. Doesn't this kind of stuff like vests and helmets fall into the costume department? The prop job correlates to almost every other job on the movie. And this is something that goes either props or wardrobe, depending on who's doing it. The gear is typically props. Occasionally, the helmets might be ha handled by the wardrobe department. And here I thought propage was all about collecting cool toys. It's serious business, especially when you're dealing with guns. It takes historical accuracy and scientific precision to modify weapons and make sure they're safe on set. Dude, what's this, a rocket launcher? This is. It's a 3.5 rocket launcher. Whoa! We used it in the movie Che. This is what's called a replica. It was a real, real tube where the working mechanisms have been removed. Because, I mean, it's really heavy and it feels real. You know? So, wait, you mod it and you take out the stuff that makes it shoot? Exactly. And then the special effects replaces it to make the explosion out of this particular type of weapon. You don't have to be a rocket launcher scientist to know that having working firearms on set is a bad idea. Modifying guns is a very exact science. What's this called? It's called the Milcor. It's a grenade launcher we used in the first Transformers. Now, this is rubber, so it's nice and light. I can hold it with one arm. Is this the real thing? This is the real thing. They look exactly the same. Can I hold the real thing with one arm? Sure. Oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> ah. Now, before I get tagged as a wimp for struggling to pick up a 15-pound grenade launcher with one hand, remember, most macho action heroes are hefting rubber ones. Need a lightweight assault rifle? No problemo. ISS will manufacture it in-house. First, they make a silicone cast of the real thing. Then fill it with a gooey polyurethane made up of two separate elements that harden when they're mixed together. Then just leave it alone for 30 minutes and presto, your own ready-made firearm. And the rubber guns aren't the only fakes around here. Can we open this up and see these bullets inside? Sure. Stand it up here. Oh. Now, these are inserts. They're not the real bullets, of course. Those are inserts for what's called a hellhound round. This is called a hellhound? Hellhound, yes. And then on the, what we've done is drilled it out. So you put a blank on the inside and it simulates the charge coming out at the end. So the blanks go in here. Th these aren't actually blanks. That's correct. Those these are, are just, just props. Yep. Showing off the armor. Dude, is that a flamethrower? It is. That's the flamethrower from Soldier. Oh, Kurt Russell used this, huh? Can I take it off? Go ahead. Oh! Now, would this be a working? I see it has the tube. The tubing here and everything. Well, generally the way it works is special effects would then make flames come out the end. All so right, they would so, control that. So he's part of just it. 
He's just holding it like this, and they take care of the rest. go off to, under, to, to like a to backpack. a tank or a backpack, yeah. and then effects would make the flame come out the end. Bring it. Now, Wade, sometimes you don't need all that firepower. Why use a grenade launcher when a simple revolver will do? ISS has that covered, too. Their pistol room contains hundreds of handguns used in movies like Pirates of the Caribbean. Send some people down to Davy Jones's locker with that, huh? They've got Mission Impossible 3 guns and Rambo's piece. This is the gun that John Rambo used in the last Rambo movie. Rambo, one of my favorites. Can we win this time? Is that a is that a Dirty Harry gun over there, or is that a? This is this is one Dirty Harry. It's an eight-shot revolver. It's a pretty oh unique my gosh. pistol. This is so Clint. Clint Eastwood held this gun and used it in a movie. Uh, I'm feeling lucky, punk. So obviously this is a real gun, and you can't shoot real guns on a movie set. Uh, what do you do to get that effect? Is it just the use of blanks, or is there something else? Yeah, we actually use real guns, but we use blanks in them. Now, a revolver like this doesn't require any modifications, but any kind of semi-automatic or automatic pistol would require some modification to make it fire blanks. So it's not just blanks, you have to actually modify the mechanics of the exactly, gun. Exactly, to simulate a bullet going through the barrel in order to make the gun function. So what exactly is the science behind modifying these guns? And more importantly, when would I fire some of these babies off? To get these answers, I'd have to meet an imposing he-man known simply as the Sergeant Major. Sounds like an undercover job, special ops. My mission was just getting started. Independent Studio Services. I've checked out guns for every cinematic occasion. Sending giant killer robots to the junkyard. Oh. Taking out street punks. I'm feeling lucky, punk. Or starting a flame war. Bring it. But even modified prop guns can be deadly if they're not handled properly. That's why you enlist the Sarge. Sergeant Major Jim Deaver is ISS Prop's own military technical advisor, whose job it is to ensure on-set safety. And yes, his cut torso probably weighs as much as my entire body. I figured if anyone could give me a little primer into the mechanics of the gun, it would be this 25-year Marine veteran. Why don't we just start by you explaining how a gun works? Sure. I'll use this handgun that was modified so you can see inside. Oh, it's like cut open so you can see the innards of it. Correct. Oh, OK, cool. Let's give you a little idea. All right. So what happens is on this handgun itself, you put a magazine in. A magazine holds round, OK? Let's give you an idea. Be inserted in the weapon, the chamber around. By round, he means bullet. The bullet sits inside a case containing gunpowder and a primer, a piece of metal that will make a spark when struck. And when you press the trigger, the firing pin hits the primer. And the primer is what, in the back of the bullet? Right here, right here, in the okay. back of the bullet, right. We okay. put it around. And, and the primer, what does that do, set off gunpowder? Correct. When gunpowder burns, it releases hot gas. The gas is what pushes the bullet out of the barrel at speeds as fast as 5,000 feet per second. With a semi-automatic weapon, that gas also pushes the spent cartridge back and out of the gun, making room for a new round to pop up from the spring-loaded magazine and into the chamber. But when you're firing blanks, there's no real bullet there to focus the gas. It just wants to go whooshing out in all directions in a big, useless cloud. So in order to make it work in a movie, you have to contain those gases? That's correct. We got to hold the gases because it's going to rechamber around. In the military, they use this gizmo, a blank firing adapter, to control where the gas goes after you pull the trigger. The gas is going to release, but there's going to be enough gas inside the weapon Two, bring the bolt back, four, just like that. So every time you shoot it, it comes back and forth. That's correct. In a military exercise, you want to be able to look at someone's weapon and see in a split second, OK, that's safe. That's correct. But Firing blanks. It doesn't look good in a movie, a big red block at the end of a gun. No. So, so that's why they have to change it. So this is really an external modifier to a gun, but in the movies, they have to modify it internally. This is a real uh, rifle right here, the M4. This is real. It's a real weapon. What they'll do is screw in a plug, and that's the modification they'll make for this weapon only. You're a military technical advisor on a movie set. What safety procedures are there? We get everybody in line. We talk to them. We give a safety class. Weapon safety is as easy as one, two, three. Lesson number one. 
Safety switch. Safety switch. Mm -hmm. See? So we make sure it's unsafe. Lesson number two. Bolts to the rear. And you check inside the chamber. If there's no device inside the chamber or anything. See okay. that right now? You look inside, it's clear. Lesson number three. Check the barrel to make sure that's clear. Because mm -hmm. if you have dirt or rocks in here, and I fire this weapon, those dirt and rocks are going at you. See? So you want to make sure all barrels are clear. Yeah. Check for the chamber. Now, the weapon is safe at this time. Weapon safety is no joke. People have been killed on set by guns firing blanks. So listen to the sergeant. Remember, I told you about the gases. Yeah. I cannot fire this weapon if somebody's in front of me or beside me. If the weapon is beside somebody, if somebody's standing, if this weapon's here and I'm standing here, that's going to hurt. Sergeant Major Deaver conducts actual boot camps with actors, drilling them till they get it right. All right, I've seen some amazing equipment, some crazy cool guns. I've learned how guns work. Now I kind of got an itchy trigger finger, man. I kind of want to shoot one. We can do that. Yeah? Yes, we can. Let's do it. Let's go. Before I head to the test chamber to test my manhood, I'm going to have to get into character. Oh, you look like you're ready. Don't call me Nar. Call me Commander. All right, now, first we do is give you some ear protection. Nah, those don't look cool enough. You have any in black? Oh, yes, we do. All right, eye protection, ear protection. First up, a 45 caliber pistol. I came here to chew gum and blow stuff up. And I'm all out of gum. That's just the smell of gunpowder, huh? Now, did you see the flash? Uh, yeah, it was really a lot bigger than I expected it to be. Correct. That's why we talked about having people next to you. That could cut into somebody or blind somebody. When we're uh, filming, I have to make sure that the personnel is not in front of you when that weapon goes off, because that could hurt somebody. Yeah. could even kill somebody. Bring on the Beretta 9mm, Bruce Willis's weapon of choice in Die Hard. Didn't you get the memo? You're fired. Monster trucker. Next is the MP5. Whoa, OK. This is a submachine gun. If I was going to go full automatic, I would press the trigger down for two seconds, have a four round burst, boom, 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 boom. I wouldn't have a full keep the finger down, OK? OK. You want to give burst. Go boom, 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 boom. That's how you do that. Give me about five or six round bursts. Have fun. Weapon, put it on safe. See how quick that went through? Wow. That was almost 30 rounds. Finally, the M4. This is the Papa Bear. To be or not to be? Not to be. Do you feel it? <laughs> yeah, I felt that kickback, man. You feel that? <laughs> yeah, and I felt it trying to pull up. I thought I did a pretty good job of keeping it straight, man. Outstanding job. Thank you. Wow, Jim, thank you so much. I think I'm ready to go battle the forces of Cobra now. You know, the, the science of using weapons in the movies is so much different than, you know, what you see in the movies. Here's a final lesson in weapon safety. Always be polite, especially to men who know how to fire every weapon under the sun. Thank you so much for, uh, for giving me the lesson. I appreciate it. Pleasure. All right, take care. You too. I sounded like a sand person, I think, from Star Wars. Ali Ali Oxen. Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, I am the walrus. OK. OK, you're the Eggman. <laughs> no, never mind. You're not English, so you don't get it. <laughs> so. This is called a Shatner dramatic pause. <laughs> <That's right. laughs>